Hello. Uh, I've got to be honest, I think I didn't think this through. These visuals looked fine on my little laptop. It might be a bit overwhelming uh, on a screen this big. Um, so apologies if it induces epilepsy or anything. But the, the reason for the visuals is um, I thought this was a good parallel. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So uh, the history of the art industry has primarily followed the same form in that it's paint on canvas. People have expressed themselves differently, obviously, through the, through the centuries, but fundamentally it's that form. But this artist, French guy, Thomas Thomas Blanchard, tried to do something different and use paint and the movement of paint as the art itself. I thought that was an interesting parallel, trying to do something different. It sounds pretentious now I say it out loud, but hey, I'm a planner. Planners are pretentious. It's also post-rationalized, if I'm honest, which is also a plannery thing to do, because uh, <laughs> um, the truth is, I, I thought I just needed some distracting visuals, because I'm going to be talking about agency remuneration, which is pretty dry, so I thought distract with some visuals. So um, I'm going to come on to talk about some strategy things, some quite specific things that may or may not be useful, I don't know. Um, but also start off with some agency things about Anomaly. And I apologize a little bit, because I don't mean it to sound too silly, but um, the APG did ask me to say a few of these things, because the reason I'm here is definitely not for me. It's not that I've got anything particularly interesting to say. It's just that Anomaly is a, and the model of Anomaly was formed really as a reaction to a changing industry. So some of those principles might be interesting. Um, so that's what this is. So the first uh, section really is on some agency principles. And the first one, how exciting is this? I'm going to talk about timesheets. Um, <laughs> bet you're glad you came. Um, uh, and the thing about timesheets is uh, we don't do timesheets. We've never done timesheets, which is nice in and of itself because they're boring and everyone makes timesheets up. It's, everyone knows it's a nonsense. Um, but it's not about that. It's about not charging by time. So we were founded on a principle of not charging by time, which most of the industry does. And instead, we charge a value-based fee and then try and put all of our, or at least a disproportionate amount of our profit at risk against success metrics in some ways. Now, not every agency can do that, but I think every agency can and should put a disproportionate amount of their fee or their revenue into some kind of performance because it forces, I think, really exciting behavior for agencies and, um, and individual strategies. But I do think charging by time is, the wrong thing to do anyway, because it incentivizes you to take longer, put more people on it, which isn't in the client's interest. So we were founded on a different principle. But, so, but the bigger thing really is trying to put more into performance and really being accountable uh, to, to the effectiveness of what you do in various ways. And I can talk about the detail of that if anyone's interested. But I think one of the things that it is exciting, the ramification that's exciting is, and you talked about good questions, Matt, in your intro, it really forces a strategist or an agency to really ask a question about the question you've been asked. If you're not going to get paid, if you're not going to make your margin, if what you do doesn't work, it really forces you to think, is this the right question? Do I need to reframe this business challenge in a way that actually is going to be the right thing for the client? So that's, a, that's an exciting thing. So it pushes you upstream a little bit to ask those bigger questions and make sure you're really interrogating, is it a good question? Which is exciting, I think, for strategists. The second thing I think it forces is um, a more open attitude to creativity, which I think has two components to it. One is it means you can't be biased towards any particular channel or solution. If you're, again, if you're not going to make your margin, if you're not going to make your highest return on investment for the agency, uh, if it doesn't work, it means you, are, you can't be biased towards a thing that you think is more exciting. Or is, you can only be biased to what is right, what you think is right, what you think is going to be the most interesting thing. And that doesn't mean you're less creative. On the contrary, I think it just means you have a more open attitude to what a creative idea is. So uh, it might be... Um, <coughs> Paul Smith stripes, that's a creative idea. Yes, advertising is a creative idea. Um, we didn't do this, but Amazon, you know, if, if you, people who bought this bought this, that's an amazing creative idea. And so uh, structuring yourself in a way that you're incentivized by success, I think, forces you to think and have the opportunity to think about what a creative idea is more broadly. It doesn't make you any less creative. I just think it broadens the nature of what a creative idea might be, which again, I think is exciting for, for, for any agency and certainly for a strategist within it. It also means culturally, and Sally talked about collaboration being key, it means you have to be more collaborative. And every agency talks about collaboration and how we're all collaborative, great. But the reality is we're not always. But if you have a system and a, and a kind of financial model where um, the right answer might be uh, just a media partnership, 
that often is the case. The right answer might be to do nothing, it's unlikely, but that might be the right answer. Um, or at least to take the previous agency's work and change it slightly, which most creative agencies probably wouldn't think of as a, an opportunity. But if you're incentivized that way, what that means is it could be a junior comm strategist has the idea because they might say, actually put all the money, all the money into sponsoring this thing. And what you have to have in that context is a, like senior creatives, the ECD has to go, yeah, that probably is the right thing. So you can't have ego. So the money forces all this behavior. And whether or not you can be in an agency that doesn't charge by time or not, if you can be in an agency that really, or try and push for your clients to put more into performance related bonuses, it forces all this, I think, really exciting behavior and keeps us honest. Um, the next thing is that anomaly, um, we create and own our own IP, and that's not because we think we'll get rich on it, and we don't do much of it. And by that, I don't mean um, like just backing people's hobbies. I mean actual product innovation. And the value of that is not because we're going to get rich, because we only do it once or twice now. We've learned over the years the hard way. You don't compete with China on manufacturing and venture capitals. Sharks, lawyers are going to crush you in an instant. So we, but we do one or two of them just so we understand what it means to develop product and we, we can apply that elsewhere. Um, so our, at the moment we have, um, the main one we have is the medical marijuana product. We, so we designed it, we um, obviously didn't do the science of it, but uh, it's doing incredibly well in America. It's positioned as a wellness brand. And the, but the point of it is it forces us to understand what it means to wh where you put a product on shelf. That kind of stuff is forced, that kind of behavior is forced when you develop your own product. And the final thing, um, is having a global p and I think is incredibly useful and it again comes back to if you're not charging people by time you can have uh, a global p and and not local p and it means that you can kind of move people around uh, intellectually and strategists can get involved in different projects um, which is really useful to us um, and, and I think it just means that if your answer can be anything it means that you don't have to have everything in every single office. We've got seven offices, but spread across those seven, we do have specialisms. And not having a local PNL means you just don't have that bullshit that you have in micro networks where everyone's fighting for a bit and you can genuinely swap intellectual capital and make it fluid. So that is, um, has, has the, has the people at the front must be struggling with the visuals. That's what I'm, I'm particularly wor worried about. Um, if anyone's pregnant, I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> Maybe leave the room. Um, so coming on to the strategy things, um, and I've got two and a bit minutes left for this. So the first observation is I would encourage people to work somewhere open. And I don't necessarily mean move agency, although if, if, if you do move agency, I would encourage you to really interrogate is the environment there going to be open for a strategist? Are you genuinely going to have a collaborative opportunity with the creatives? And of course, in an interview, people will say that that's the case, but do everything you can to find out if that's true. Will it be open? Is, the, is it truly collaborative? As a strategist, will I get to think broadly? Can briefs be opened out to something bigger? But it doesn't mean move to another agency necessarily. It might mean move to a group within your existing agency where there's more of that, or even to an account where it is just more open and it's more collaborative and the opportunities are broader for a strategist. So I'd say that. Second thing I'd say is delay the brief. Um, excuse me. Um, we have a thing anomaly called anomalous sessions, which means when a client brief comes in, because you know what it's like, client brief comes in, there's always a pressure to get that brief into the creative department as quickly as possible. But much better if you can, and I realize this is naive, and you can't always do this, obviously, but where possible, having a bit of time where you get everyone senior around a table and just go, before you write the brief, what is the sort of answer? What shape of answer might be right here? Maybe we don't need the creative department. Maybe it's actually some sort of consultancy thing first. Just taking a pause and genuinely thinking in the most open way possible before you decide to brief the creative department and assume that the, the creative department is going to crack it. Maybe it's a media part, whatever it might be. So I think that's, again, not everyone can do that. But if you can, I think that's incredibly helpful to create the kind of ideas and the kind of work that I think increasingly the industry might be looking for. Um, the next thing, and, and Sally, you might have to put earmuffs on for this bits because I totally agree with everything you, you said about the importance of the comms model and I would encourage everybody, whatever sort of strategist you are, is to try and own that comms model and I'm not trying to take business away from you but if, you, if you're not owning that you're really missing out because what I've noticed in recent years is the value of, because you know it's like in the old days, uh, agencies would 
you do the big brand idea bit in a presentation, and then you do the big exciting creative idea bit, and then it'd be the media bit. And the media bit, sometimes you run out of time, or it's tagged on at the end. Um, but the reality is increasingly, I'm, we're seeing value from actually putting that up the front. And I don't mean detailed media plans. I mean the comms principles, the comms approach, the go-to-market approach. Actually, that's the reality of what most clients are interested in. That's where the money is. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of harder working stuff. And then put creative and ideas into that. But I think any good strategist should want to own that because there's creativity in that. And I don't mean detail. I just mean sort of a broad kind of go-to-market. And we want business just on that. We have, the work's been shit, frankly, and the, the, some of that, but just the kind of smartness of this is the reality of how this thinking is going to play out. So I'd encourage everybody to try and do that and own that. The next thing, um, and I've just run out of time, so I'm at the end and I'm now not starting, thankfully, my presentation, but a couple of minutes, I've only got what, two left. Uh, start at the end. So in a world where programmatic is increasingly important and performance marketing, I think there's, there's an opportunity for strategists to think at the end of the process and work back strategically. The AIDA model that's been around since 1904, um, awareness, interest, decision, action, whatever it is, um, yeah, it's great, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but you know, 1904. Uh, the industry has changed a lot since then, so I wouldn't say don't think in those terms, but I think there's value in starting at the end as another way of thinking about it and thinking about, all right, so at the moment at which our comms are handing over to transaction, to purchase, whatever it is, start there. Think about that. Really sweat those details. What are the insights into the, what the consumer is thinking at that point? What is the exact call to action that we should have that's really going to prompt action that's going to prompt um, transactional purchase. We don't really, it's an afterthought for us typically. But if we think there, that's really helpful because then we go, right, what's the perfect call to action? Right now, what is the brand meaning that we put into that call to action? And you sort of work backwards. We have found success by doing that. And it's not necessary to replace doing it the other way. But it's, it's a kind of, it's a way of thinking about it. So you're from the start thinking about action, thinking about performance, which is the way the industry is going. And the final point, which is a different type of thought, is don't work five days. And uh, I don't mean work six or seven. I mean uh, work, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we have both at an agency level, but also in the department, I think eight out of the 12 strategists I've got work three or four days at Anomaly and do other things on the, on, on the side. And I think increasingly we're in an industry where it's hard to attract talent. And so I think that is a big thing going forward. I think we have to think more flexibly and openly about what people want to do with their lives. And it's a value to the agency. We wouldn't get these people otherwise. But also when those people are there for those three or four days, they're really on it. And they do other things that they bring in. So I would encourage all of you, if you're at a stage where you can, is to not give yourself to one agency. It's too late for me. I'm old. I've got three kids and a mortgage, and I need the money. So I do five days. But for the rest of you, I would not if you can. So that is me. Thank you. Thank you.